Uh, that last song that we just did, you didn't know the words to it because we wrote it. It's, a, uh, it's an in-house song, yep. Right. Pastor Josh, our executive pastor, and um, Shauna uh, sat down and were kind of playing one day and wrote that song, so we decided to sing it today. Amen. So I hope you watched last week online. If you did not, I would encourage you to either go to our YouTube channel or our website. Go back and look at last week's message. It was the beginning of this new series called Unguarded. Unguarded. And we, look, we are looking at the steps that led up to Peter denying Jesus. The unguarded steps of, that Peter took to denying Jesus. A lot of us just look at the fact that he makes this declaration, I'll never deny you, and then he denies him, but we don't look at the steps in between as to what happened leading up to that. And we discovered last week that uh, if you do not guard your gifts, your giftedness, your talents, your abilities, what God has placed in you, your future, your destiny, whatever you wanna call it, if you take that for granted, it could end up being uh, a weapon instead of a blessing. Guarding your gift. What has God gifted you with? And if you sit here today and you're like, man, I really don't know what God has gifted me with. Trust me, we all have a gift from God. We all have a purpose from God. You just gotta take some time, figure it out. That's the journey of life. That's the beautiful thing of life, amen? amen. Today I wanna look at Peter's unguarded heart. Peter's unguarded heart. And I wanna take a look at the story, okay? In Luke 22, this is the story. Jesus went out, as usual, to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Now, he's not saying to them, pray so that you don't sin, because what they were about to do and what was about to happen really wasn't a sin, but it'd be a temptation to walk away from their calling. They're about to see Jesus die, and instead of continuing with ministry and opening up churches, they're all gonna go back and do their day job again. They're all gonna go back and be fishermen and all this other stuff. So he says, pray that when circumstances happen, and they're gonna happen, that you have a plan and that you're ready for it. I need you to pray, okay? So he withdrew about a stone's throw away. If you're wondering how far a stone's throw, go throw a stone, that's about as far as he was. He knelt down and he prayed and he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared and, said to, and, and came to him, strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and he sweat like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he arose from prayer, he went back to his disciples, and he found them sleeping. I thought I asked you to pray. Now, could you imagine for a second? Because I just think about my own business, my own, my own job here. If I was in there with my staff and I said, all right, everybody, I want you to take about five minutes. I want you to pray about the weekend service. I'm gonna go into the family room. I'll be right back. I go into the family room and I come back. My whole staff is asleep. <laughs> they're at their desk asleep. They're at the table asleep. They're on the couches asleep. Go! I'm paying you to do work and you're sleeping? Jesus walks up, and I think he gave him a little kick. Boom, right, a little kick. He found them sleeping. Watch. Exhausted from sorrow, Jesus asks, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. He catches them sleeping twice. Twice, this whole thing, Jesus actually prays three times. He comes back, finds him asleep twice. He says, can you not tarry even an hour? Can you not stay up and pray? Now watch the irony. Just a few verses before this, Peter says, I'm ready to go to prison with you. I'm ready to die with you, but I can't pray with you. Huh? How many of us believe that when we leave this life, we're gonna go to heaven at some time? Okay, so we're banking on that, right? So how's your prayer life? How's your prayer life now? 
How often do you talk to God now? Are you waiting to save up all your conversations for when we actually get to heaven? I'm just, hey, I'm just throwing some stuff out here. Just some, this guy's like, I will die for you. I'll go to prison with you. Jesus, yeah, but all I need you to do is pray. I don't need you to get hurt. I don't need you to hang on a cross. I don't need you to die. Just pray. Nah, dude, that's too easy. Give me the hard stuff. Come on, let's think about this for a second, guys. How could he have the fortitude to die or go to prison and he can't even pray? He couldn't even pray an hour. His heart wasn't guarded. His heart wasn't guarded. Let me ask you this. It makes me wonder how many times we make big declarations of faith but fail to take the small steps of obedience that lead us to the fulfillment of those declarations. It's the beginning of the new year. I'm gonna read my Bible every day, but you don't even move the Bible out of the bookshelf next to your bed to do it, right? I'm gonna go to the gym every day, but you don't even go get a gym membership. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. I'm just throwing stuff, stuff out there. This is, this is not legalism. This is not judgment. None of this. I want us to think about us. I want you to think about you. How's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? Jesus says, stay awake and pray that you may not fall during a time of trial. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus says, pray that you're not led into temptation. And this was a warning. This was the moment that would have prepared Peter to say, yes, I know Jesus, one questioned. But he didn't. He didn't take the time in prayer to build himself up to enable his gift to be bold, to stand up with and for Jesus. Here's the truth about a prayer life. Are you ready? Here's the truth about prayer. You're never going to be celebrated for it. No one's, man, you pray so much. You are the best. Because it's done in secret. See, we like to do things that we actually get credit for. We like to be on stage and sing because people can hear our voice. But what about every single Tuesday night that we come out and practice that nobody hears us? We do prayer meeting every uh, once a month on a Saturday. Come out prayer. We put in the time in in prayer. See, it doesn't get celebrated. Prayer doesn't get celebrated. Prayer is a moment that is not going to get any likes on Instagram. Prayer is not one of those things that you'd get credit for or possibly ever be seen. And that's why it's not often done. That's why a lot of Christians, come on, man, this is me too, me too, me too. A lot of Christians have a pathetic prayer life because it's not flashy and it's boring and it's work. And that's true. I wonder if Peter did obey. If Peter did obey and stayed up and prayed, if the story would have even made it into the Bible. Stay up and pray. He comes back, they're praying. End of story. It wouldn't have been written down. Come on. Think about this for a second. Peter decided to sleep instead of pray and he left his mind and his heart unguarded for when a trial came. Prayer is the protective force that surrounds your life, not a mask. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Prayer is, a, is the protective force that surrounds your life. You ever see that movie? I, I'm going to date myself now. It's like the boy in the bubble. Is that John Travolta? Yeah, old, I know. Like, that's what prayer does. Prayer puts you in that big bubble suit, man. It covers you. It positions us in a place of power. We should never underestimate the power of prayer in our own lives. Amen. We need to pray for others. We need to pray for the world. But we also need to take time and pray for ourselves 
And in those moments of praying for ourselves, we need to take an inventory of our own heart. Take an inventory of our own heart. Let me ask you this today. How's the condition of your heart? And I'm not talking about the one that's pumping oxygenated blood through your body. I'm not talking about that one. I'm talking about your spiritual heart, the center of you. The center of you, if you take spirit, soul, and body as three circles that intersect in the middle, there's this little spot right there that would be your heart. It's the center of all things, the spirit, soul, and the body coming together. What's the condition of your heart? And I'm not saying this in a religious way or a legalistic way, but prayer is is a relational imperative in the life of every believer. Sometimes we look at prayer as a discipline, but prayer is more than a discipline. Prayer is more than a discipline. Prayer, ready? Get this. Prayer is an indicator of the health of your relationship with God. If I spoke to my wife for only five minutes every Sunday, how healthy would my relationship be? All right, let's go beyond that. Let's go beyond that. How would my relationship be if I went to church every Sunday and listened to you talk about my wife for 35 minutes? but I never actually talked to her. How healthy would my relationship be? But we all want to go to heaven. You gonna talk to him? You gonna talk to him when you get there? Do you know what he cares about? Do you know his heartbeat? Do you know his thoughts? Because we can know all that stuff now. I'm just throwing this out. This, listen, I'm preaching to me. I know we're getting quiet. I know we're getting quiet because like, ouch, ow. I get it. I'm talking to me, all right? I know that statement stings, but if you never talk to God, then do you have a healthy relationship with him? Any relationship that exists without communication is unhealthy. Prayer guards your heart. Prayer guards your heart. Prayer is a secret place. It's an uncelebrated place. At times, prayer can be a painful place, but it is a crucial place. So I want you to ask yourself this question. Here's an inventory. What does my prayer life look like right now? And what does my relationship with Jesus Christ look like in light of that? So I'm gonna give you a tip. Here's just how I pray because, dude, seriously, seriously, Trying to get this ADD guy to pray for an hour ain't gonna happen. <laughs> ain't gonna happen. I cannot pray for an hour. I'm telling you straight out. I can't pray for 30 minutes. Straight out. But man, can I go at it for five minutes. <laughs> so when I get up, I go take a shower. That's my first time of prayer. And then on my drive, my five second drive from my house to work, it's another time of prayer. Then when no one's here at work, and I go to the bathroom, another few minutes of prayer. (laughs) Come on, man, nobody's gonna tell you like this. If anybody ever makes you feel guilty because you can't pray an hour straight, they, they, they don't even live in this world. But in the pockets and moments and the quiet times of life, can you pray? Can you pray? Peter had an unguarded heart. Now, here we're gonna make a shift, ready? Peter's unguarded heart led to him having an unguarded mouth. You got a mouth guard? I used to play soccer, and because I had braces, I had to wear a mouth guard when I played soccer. Protect my teeth, protect my braces from popping out through my lips. I just wondering, do you have a mouth guard? Do you have something that stands at the gate of your mouth that says, shut up! Don't say that. Shut up. Maybe your spouse is that. I don't know. A corrupted heart will come out of a corrupted mouth. 
Check this out, Luke 6, 43. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. So let me just throw this out there. Let's just look at this real quick. When people listen to you, when people listen to what you talk about, they will decide whether you are a believer in Jesus or not. That's what it's talking about. What's it talking about? Is what's coming out of your mouth representative of a believer in Jesus? Is what comes out of your mouth positive, uplifting, and life-giving? Or is what's coming out of your mouth negative, tearing down, and gossipy? That's what this is saying. Okay? People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good that's stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I don't like that verse. I don't like that verse. You know why I don't like that verse? Because that verse stings. I'm gonna give you an example. And did anybody notice that all the speakers are gone from hanging on the ceiling? I took them down this week by myself. I was up on that lift doing some stuff and one of the, one of the steel beams slid over, hit my hand hard, almost teared, almost had a little tear, it hurt. Now listen, with all transparency and honesty, I did not say hallelujah Jesus. <laughs> I didn't say hallelujah Jesus. I wish I was more spiritual. I do. I do wish I was more spiritual. That hit me so hard. <laughs> it, made, it made me like, ugh. Like, I almost gagged. It hurt so bad. I thought I was going to have to go to the hospital. But a dirty wordy came out of my mouth. <laughs> if you can't come to this church anymore, I completely understand. <laughs> but a dirty wordy came out of my mouth when that thing hit my hand. And I was up, however high that is, 20-something feet, jumping up and down inside the lip like this. This verse just said, out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth spoke. Which means that dirty wordy was in my heart. Which means more dirty wordy than hallelujah Jesus was in my heart. What's coming out your mouth? Pointing at me. What's coming out your mouth? I know. Forgive me, Jesus. Because it says, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Whatever your heart is full of, your mouth will speak. Let's just, let's just break this down stupid simple. Ready? Someone's, we're taking communion. Someone spills grape juice. I go get a sponge and I mop up the grape juice with the sponge. Yes? I go to the sink. I wring out the sponge. Orange juice is going to come out, right? Huh? She said yes. She said yes right here. <laughs> what comes out? Why? Because that's what the sponge is full of. Whatever the sponge absorbed, when I wring it, is going to come back out. Whatever it's full of, when squeezed, it's going to come out. That's what this verse is telling us. An unguarded heart, allowing things in, allowing wounds in, pains in, under pressure, it will come out. What's coming out your mouth? What are you putting on your social media? How upset are you about politics all around, either side? Come on, somebody. Out of, so let's, let's do this. Well, I'm not saying anything bad. Out of the abundance of your heart, your fingers are tight. <laughs> Listen, nobody can make you angry. You don't even want to hear this. You don't want to hear this. Married people, there's no such thing as being able to push each other's buttons. 
No such thing. No such thing. No such thing. Doesn't exist. Come on, come on, hear me, hear me. You can't say something that makes me feel something. I choose, I choose to respond to the stimuli, whatever you're saying, and I put a definition to it, and I choose to respond the way I respond to what you're saying. But you can't make me feel it. You can't make me angry. No one can make you have road rage. You're undisciplined emotionally. If you are angry all the time, you are undisciplined emotionally because nobody can make you angry. You're choosing to be angry. You're choosing to be miserable. You're painting your whole world. Yeah, but you don't know what I went through. Okay, I don't. But are you a Christian? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Which means at some point, you put on your disciplined panties and you get over your past. You get over your past. You ain't never heard panties in church before. Can you cut that out of the video, please? <laughs> Whatever comes out your mouth is what your heart is full of. Let me ask you, what's the condition of your heart? Have you had a heart check lately? And I'm not talking about go, going to get an echo, echocardiogram and all that. Have you sat down and said, what am I always talking about? Am I gossiping all the time? Am I talking negative all the time? Am I tearing people down? Am I yelling at people? Am I angry? Am I yelling at my grandkids? Am I yelling at my children? Why are you angry? Why, why are you angry? You're choosing to do that. And now you're causing wounds on other people. An unguarded heart leads to an unguarded mouth. Proverbs 4.23, written by Solomon, wisest man that's ever existed. He says, above all else, above all else, above anything else I've ever said, above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Then he says this, look, if you don't guard your heart, you'll have a perverse mouth. Corrupt talk will come from your lips if you don't guard your heart. That's what he's saying here, right? Guard your heart, then guard your mouth. If you don't guard your heart, you can't guard your mouth. All nasty stuff's gonna start coming out your mouth. Let me tell you this. You will say things you would have never said if your heart gets hurt. All right? You're in a dating relationship, marriage relationship, whatever. Person says or does something that hurts your heart. Next thing you know, something comes out your mouth. I didn't mean to say that. Yeah, you did. You just didn't mean them to hear it. You had been rehearsing that thing in your head for years, but you had a guard. You had a guard over your mouth. And right when you were going to say it other times, you didn't. You pulled it back. But man, did you have it ready in your pocket. I swear to God, if she ever, oh, if she, oh, I got this one right, right here. Oh. All of a sudden, your heart gets hurt. There it is. Flies out your mouth faster than you could stop it. As soon as you say, oh, I, yeah, you did. You meant to say it. Shouldn't have said it. Because now you inflicted a wound. Because you were wounded. Hurting people hurt people. Hurting people. I'm hurting, now I'm gonna say something, I'm gonna hurt you. Guard your heart It'll guard your mouth. Peter's unguarded, injured heart leads him to deny Jesus. Let me give you a little bit of backstory. Jesus with his disciples, they're chilling in this garden setting. Jesus saying, hey, they're gonna come arrest me. This is gonna happen. Jesus tells them, go buy some swords. They're like, swords? We got two right here. Is this enough? And Jesus is like, yeah, that's good. Bothered me. Bothered me really bad. I don't understand why Jesus tells them to go get some swords. That, that goes against the whole story on the uh, parable on the mount. Someone hits you in the cheek, turn the other cheek. Then why are you telling me to go buy swords? Don't make no sense. I had to pray about it, man, because I got mad. I got bothered. I was like, there's a contradiction in the Bible. Jesus told guys to buy swords. It was only circumstantial and situational. 
He had them, he wanted them to have swords for that moment because the Roman soldiers were gonna come to arrest him. The Roman soldiers would have never arrested an unarmed man. He was guilty of nothing. So he rolls up, well, let's read the story. Luke 22, verse 47, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up, Roman soldiers came up, and, and uh, religious leaders and the man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with our swords? They only had two of them for 12, just so you know. And look what it says, and one of them, we're talking about Peter, Peter the bold guy, I'll die for you. He grabs one of the swords and he, whoosh, strikes the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. You may be asking, why did he cut the dude's ear off? Because Peter was a fisherman, he was not a swordsman, and he missed the guy's neck. He was swinging for the dude's neck, and the guy was like, something out of the matrix, like, and it cut his ear off. But Jesus answered, no more of this. I don't get you, Jesus. Then why'd you have me get a sword? No more of this. Jesus picks up the dude's ear, puts it back on his head, heals the guy. Peter feels some sort of way. Yo, what kind of punk situation is this? Seriously, like, yo, I'm from Scotchtown. We used to fight for fun. <laughs> Lower Scotchtown would go gang up against Upper Scotchtown, and we would just go at it, man. Group, ah. Broke my nose three times. Peter's like, yo, I thought we were gonna get a good one. I'm a sailor, you know, like, Arr. Jesus is like, none of this heals the guy's ear. Peter's hurt. You gave up, Jesus. You gave in, you turned yourself over. And then you're gonna rebuke me? You're gonna tell me no more of this and heal the guy that I was just trying to defend you from? Peter feels some sort of way, his heart's hurt. His unguarded heart, he didn't pray. He didn't build himself up to, to handle the situation. Now his heart is injured. He's about to have an unguarded mouth. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officials of the temple guard, and to the elders who came after him, am I leading a rebellion that you have to come at me with swords and clubs? See, the Roman soldiers would have never arrested them unless they had swords. Now there's a reason for them to arrest him. Okay? That's why the swords. Anyway, every day, I was in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me, but now this is your hour when darkness reigns. Dude, that's heavy. Anyway, then seizing him, they led him away and took him to the house of the high priest. Look at this. Peter followed at a distance. I thought you were my right-hand man. Why are you following at a distance? We're gonna talk about that next week. You do not wanna miss next week. Next week's message is only about that one sentence. Peter followed at a distance. And, one, and, when some, and when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She asked closely to him, aren't you one of the guys that was with Jesus? But he denied it. Look what he said, woman! I don't know him. Shut up. <laughs> first denial. This is the first one. He's unguarded. A little time later, someone else asked him, you also are one of those guys, aren't you? Man, no, I'm not. Hush, man. Second denial. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly, this fellow was with him, one of the Galileans. Peter replied, man, I don't know who you're talking about. Just then the rooster crows. Look what it says here. Just then the rooster crows. And the Lord looks straight at Peter. What do you think that look looked like. Depending on the condition of your heart will determine what you think that look looked like. Do you think that look looked like disappointment? Do you think that look 
look like shame? Do you think that look looked like arrogance? Told you so. I don't. I don't think it was any of those. Because I don't look at God that way. I know how much he loves me. I know that God took all of my mistakes before him and after him into account when he called me. He factored it all into the equation. He factored all my bonehead mistakes into the equation when he called me. I think he looks over at Peter and says, you still good? You okay? This is what I was talking about. I wanted you to prepare you for this. I'm still here. Peter, we're still good. Peter, we're still good. Peter, we're still good. That's what the look was. Peter, we're still good. I'm not mad. How you look at that look determines the condition of your heart towards God. If you think that he's disappointed in you, then you will live this life of disappointing God over and over and over again. Peter remembered the words that the Lord has spoken, as scripture goes on to say, before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times, watch. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Another wound to his heart. And he did it to himself. He didn't go weep bitterly because Jesus gave him a nasty look. He wept bitterly because he did the thing that he prided himself I would never do. I want to ask you this today. Have you ever done the thing that you said you would never do? I will never do that again. And then you did it again. And not only again, but again and again and again and again and again. And I'm going to say to you, Jesus is saying, we still good? We still good? Because listen, you made that promise, he didn't. You made the promise, I would never do this. He didn't. He knew you were going to do it. And he sat there and said, we're still good. We're still good. We're still good. In another translation, it says that Peter denied knowing Jesus in vulgar profanity. Vulgar profanity, he denies Jesus. That's what comes out of him. Remember, he was a sailor. He had a sailor's mouth. And it's so funny. I bet for three years, he was so good at not saying any dirty wordies around Jesus. I mean, seriously, how awesome are you guys at not saying any dirty wordies at church on Sunday? <laughs> oh, hallelujah, brother, praise you, Jesus. What a glorious, honorable day in the sight of our precious Savior. But then someone cuts you off in the parking lot. Ah, mother, father, Jesus. Glory a Deus, Jesus Christ. <laughs> mm, he got squeezed. Peter got squeezed. And when he got squeezed, 30 something years of being a sailor came out. I don't know. Let me ask you this today, seriously, straight up. Because I wrote this sermon to me. I wrote this sermon to me of how 2020 affected me. And, and hearing myself be a little bit more negative than, than I've been trying to be. How's your heart? How's your heart? Because your heart's gonna affect your relationships. It's gonna affect how you raise your kids. It's gonna affect how you cope with stress. Come on, can we be for real for like two seconds in church? I know that what I'm about to say probably should never be talked about in church and has never, but I'm gonna say it anyway. You know, maybe, maybe uh, before uh, COVID and all the stress, maybe you would have like a glass of wine once a week at family dinner. 
but now like it's a lot more or, or something other than alcohol and you're seeing your vocabulary slip a little bit, you're seeing yourself a little bit more angry, you're seeing yourself a little bit more edgy. I'm, I'm just asking you, how's your heart? How's your heart? Because all those things, everything, anger, even shutting down, being more introverted and quiet, they're all coping mechanisms to cover up a wound in our heart. I'm not asking you today if you need a physical checkup, but do you need a spiritual checkup? I wanna give you three thoughts real quick, three quick thoughts, and we're gonna close out about how to guard your heart. Number one, guard your heart through your ears, through your ears. There's three doors that we're gonna talk about. We gotta close the door of our ears a little bit. In Proverbs 4.20, it says, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them in your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. What are you listening to? Who do you give permission to speak into your life? I'm gonna throw something out there, seriously, in all honesty. I don't care how, how old you are. If your parents still are speaking nasty negative to you, you gotta close your ears from them. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how old you are. It ain't healthy. It ain't healthy. I love you, but you don't have permission to speak to me. You're not gonna keep doing that. You're not gonna keep hurting me. People who are saying things, that hurts you. People who say things, that tear you down. I love you, and I love you with the love of the Lord. Hallelujah, praise you, Jesus. But you no longer have access to speak to me. But is that not, no, no, that's healthy. That's healthy. Jesus didn't say that, Jesus didn't say turn the other cheek and then the other cheek and then the other cheek and then just stand there and get slapped. That's not what he was saying. We gotta, we gotta protect our ears. What are you listening to, man? Some of this news you're listening to, you gotta shut it off. Number two, guard your eyes. Eyes are a second doorway to your heart. Proverbs 4.25 let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Be careful of what you let your eyes gaze upon. There's some movies we shouldn't be watching. There's some websites shouldn't be going on. All right? There's some things that we should not be looking at. Keep our eyes focused ahead. Listen, if what you're looking at is not moving you towards your godly calling and purpose in life, move it out of the way. And listen, that's not, that's not legalism at all. I'm just trying to be healthy. That's just healthy. The third one is your mind. Your mind. Proverbs 4, 4. Then he taught me and he said to me, take hold of my words with all of your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn from them. Turn away from them. Solomon is saying, get the right wisdom. Get the right thinking and focus on it. You can never live right believing wrong. You will never live in the freedom of Jesus if you think God is angry at you all the time. Ain't gonna happen. This is why the Bible tells us in Philippians 4.8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent, whatever is praiseworthy, think about these things. Keep your mind focused on good, healthy, life-giving things. See, the challenge is that we just Google too much. We Google too much. You woke up, you felt your chest was hurting. What does it mean when you wake up and your chest hurts? I'm having a heart attack. I'm having a straight heart attack. Now it's like, oh, yeah, my arm is a little numb. Oh, wait, my ear is ringing a little bit. Oh, my fingers are tingling a little bit. Oh, man, you had pizza <laughs> right before bed. But because you looked up the definition, 
you now made yourself more and more, like you began to show the symptoms because now you knew the symptoms. Now listen, if you think you're having a heart attack, go get checked out, straight out. But what are you thinking about? What are you looking at? What are you listening to? Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your spouse's heart. Don't use weapons against them. Don't injure their heart. When you feel like you're about to say something, pull back. Pull it back. You're about to take that out of the pocket, put it back. Actually, just throw it out. Just throw it out. Let it go. Moving forward together. Father, we thank you that you can empower us, enable us to guard our hearts with all diligence. I pray, God, that we would not fall into the same temptation that Peter did, that we could avoid the steps that he took to his fall, that we could pray more often, that we could follow your obedience, that we could guard our hearts with all diligence. I thank you, Lord, today that we'd wring out the sponge of our hearts of things that are corrupt. We'd wring out the sponge of our hearts of things that are hurting us and causing more pain. And we would absorb your goodness. We would absorb your grace. We would absorb your mercies into our lives. That when pressures do come, the words that come out of our mouths would bring life and comfort to those who find them. Lord, I thank you today as we leave here that we're protected and safe. Everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. I love you. Offering baskets are at the doors.